Okay. Uh, so this is actually probably the panel I was looking forward to the most. Uh, this is about shocks ahead. It's the bad news, but it's also the good news. That's a reminder for gloomsters like Larry that you have to think of a few good things that are ahead as well. And we're going to try to bring together the rather uh, pessimistic outlook we heard from the economists uh, with uh, the very optimistic Greenfields perspective we heard from the Education Frontiers people over lunch. So we have, a, as ever, a very, very wide-ranging, uh, brilliant panel. And how we're going to do this is I will quickly introduce everyone. Each person will make a few very brief opening remarks. I'll give you all a chance to respond to each other's points of view. Then we'll have a few questions. Okay, gentlemen? Okay, so we have, I'll just introduce people in the order they are seated. Ron Noble, he's the Secretary General of Interpol. Okay, so don't commit any crimes. Uh, then we have uh, Larry Summers, who we he have heard from already today, former President of Harvard, former Secretary of the Treasury, among many other things. Uh, Michio Kaku, who we have also heard from today, the man with the contact lenses that let your husband spy on you and other developments for the future. Uh, General Petraeus, who we heard from on the last panel, former director of the CIA and also a professor at CUNY now. Uh, and Lamberto Zanier, the secretary general of the OSCE. Okay, so uh, again, we have such great panels, it's almost impossible for me to figure out precedent. So I'm just gonna ask people to speak in the order in which they're seated and I'll ask Ron to go first with your good, good news, bad news up ahead. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, since I'm the Secretary General of Interpol, it's important for me to start off with the bad news. Okay, so I'm gonna try to scare you and leave it to my panelists uh, to give you hope afterwards. So I'm gonna start with a question. If I were to ask you what the number one smuggled, most smuggled good in the world is today, most of you would probably think it's some kind of illegal drug, such as cocaine. People is not bad. People's not bad. I'm going to tell you how close you are to being not bad. In fact, it's cigarettes. This year, there will be 700 billion cigarettes smuggled worldwide. 100 times the world population. As much revenue as organized crime gets from drug trafficking, they get from smuggled cigarettes. Lost revenue worldwide for governments, 40 to 50 billion. If we were to take the Ukraine as an example, because we're talking about a changing Ukraine in a challenging world, the Ukraine, seven billion. What does that translate to in terms of lost revenue in the Ukraine? Think about it. The kind of good that could, be, that could occur. It's Ukraine. One country, seven billion smuggled cigarettes, 700 billion worldwide. So this issue of traffic and illicit goods is huge, huge, huge for Interpol's perspective. Second, we all traveled here, most of us internationally. Larry and I joined the Treasury Department under President Clinton in 1993, when the first World Trade Center bombing occurred. Okay. The person that mastermind that attack entered the U.S. carrying a stolen passport. What lessons has the world learned? This year there'll be about 400 million international air arrivals where they won't have their passports checked against Interpol's databases. When they are checked, last year we hit the 60,000 mark. Again, it should shock you. It shocks me every time they take my passport and I ask myself what they're doing with my passport. The third, and I'll close with this, is the virtual world. The virtual world becoming an intersected with the real world. The example I gave was in July of this year in the Knesset, the most secure facility on earth. A journalist was seated 10 rows away from Prime Minister Netanyahu. On his lap, pointing at the Prime Minister, was a gun. Undetected, because it was plastic. How was it made? Downloading an application online. Undetected by Israeli security. Operational where the virtual world meets the real world. So I've labeled these things that should shock you as sort of invisible, because you don't think about it. You don't see it as readily. 
But the real world consequences we know from 9-11, we know from organized crime and terrorists is very, very serious. So I would conclude with that pessimistic uh, introduction, but in the end, I hope that I can leave you all smiling. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, you have done a very good and effective job of scaring us. Thank you very much. Larry, are you gonna continue on that theme? Could, could I please just make a comment? Uh, Larry and I joined uh, the Clinton administration together, and he's not only brilliant and kind, but he has the best poker face I've ever seen. He was completely unfazed by what I just said. So that's what I'd say. Larry, you're the best poker player I know. It's please. because he knew it already. It could be the best of times, and it could be the worst of times. What technology and markets have the potential to bring to humanity over the next 15 years is without precedent in human history. It took 2,300 years from the time of ancient Athens to the time of London in 1800 for living standards to rise by 50%. In many emerging markets where close to half of humanity lives, it has, for intervals in the last 15 years, taken seven years to achieve that kind of growth. That kind of progress is without precedent. One thinks about what information technology has the prospect of doing to eliminate drudgery, to extend human life, to broaden the circle of the human experience so that anyone anywhere with a device that costs $100 can be in touch with anyone else anywhere and anything that humanity has ever known. This is a moment of unprecedented potential for growth, for better lives, and for better understanding everywhere. That's why there is enormous potential in this moment. But I would say to you also that it is a moment of enormous, enormous risk. If you study the history of the 20th century, I think you can make a case that the decade that saw the most fantastic technological innovation that changed the lives of people everywhere was the 1920s. As the automobile became pervasive, as electrification became pervasive, as flight became a reality for many people, as artificial fabrics and, and uh, new chemicals changed the way people lived. And yet, and yet, what followed that enormous technological uh, progress? We know what the 30s brought and what they ushered in. What caused all of that is a matter that historians still debate and a matter of intense complexity. But Yeats, writing at the beginning of the 1920s, was all too prescient when he wrote, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed. And everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I would say that question, can a moderate center committed to freedom, to markets, to international understanding, to the idea of progress, can that center hold? 
That is the question that will determine whether the phenomenal potential of this moment is realized. Okay. Wow. Uh, I have to say, uh, Larry quoting uh, Yates is not one of the things I expected today. That's wonderful. Thank you. Michio. First, the good news. I'm a physicist. We rank civilizations by energy into type one, type two, and type three. A type one civilization consumes the energy output of an entire planet. They mine the oceans. They have uh, cities in the sky. They control earthquakes and volcanoes. They control the weather, type one. Type two exhausts the power of a planet and they go to the star. They control the output of the sun and they've colonized a few neighboring planets like the TV show Star Trek. Then there's type three. The only other energy source is the galaxy and they mine the entire galaxy roaming the galactic space lanes. Now what are we? What are we on this scale that we physicists have created? We are type zero. We get our energy from dead plants. But get a calculator. Growing at 3% a year, you can numerically calculate when we will be type one. And it is in 100 years. And we see the beginnings of it everywhere. What is the internet? What is the internet? It's the beginning of a type one telephone system. We are privileged to be alive to see the birth of the first major type one technology. What language will these type one people uh, speak in in 100 years? On the internet, you can already see it. The number one language is, en is English. The number two language is Mandarin. What kind of economy will we be in? Look at NAFTA and the European Union. We see the beginning of a type one economy. We see the beginning of a type one sports, uh, soccer and the Olympics. We see the beginning of a type one youth culture, rock and roll. We see the beginnings everywhere we see the beginnings of a type one civilization. But they're winners and losers. First of all, the great winner is democracy. The Arab Spring is a byproduct of the fact that information will become planetary in the future, which means that and also, democracies do not war with other democracies. Write down every single war you memorized since you were in grade school. Every single war was between kings, queens, dictators, never, never between two great democracies. So the great winner will be democracies, and the great loser will be dictatorships. And then the question is, who is the vanguard of this revolution? Visionary politicians, philosophers, scientists? No, the vanguard of this great revolution is children. Your children do not play with their next door neighbors anymore. Your children play with somebody from Australia, somebody from Russia, somebody from Borneo. Your kids already think like they are in a type one civilization. Another problem is the rich and the poor. I was watching Downtown Abbey the other day, a program popular in England. And then the question was, what happened to the old mansions of 1900? What happened to the landed aristocracy? And there was a panel discussion. They said, it's very obvious, the coming of machines. Wealth no longer came from land. It came from machines and commodities like coal and oil. Now we're witnessing the next great transition from agriculture to machines, to information. So the rich are getting richer, but is it because the rich steal from the poor? Is that what it's all about, the rich stealing from the poor? No, the poor are making more money, just like they made money on land, just like they made money on machines. Now it's information. And therefore, what we have to do is educate the poor so they too can create value. And now let's talk about the losers. Some people don't like this. Some people cannot articulate this, but they don't like a scientific, multicultural, advanced civilization. And these are the terrorists. Terrorists in their gut cannot explain necessarily why they are terrorists, but they instinctively do not like a scientific, multicultural civilization. Today, for example, in many societies, we have wealthy people who are bilingual. They speak a European language and the local language. In the future, we will be biplanetary. We will have the planetary culture, like rock and roll, Chanel, Gucci, the planetary culture, and the local culture. We will be biplanetary, just like today, people are bilingual. 
And also, another loser is the question of safety. Biogerms become a real big threat. In the future, very soon, a high school kid will be able to type ATCG, ATCG on a typewriter, and create a virus. This is coming very soon. And it means that the possibility of airborne AIDS is a danger. 98% of the human race is vulnerable to AIDS. Only 2% are invulnerable. Therefore, if AIDS becomes airborne, you can literally wipe out 98% of the population. And also, people are worried about Iran. Iran uses, of course, ultracentrifuges. The next stage beyond ultracentrifuges is laser enrichment. Laser beams can already differentiate between U-235 and U-238. Laser enrichment could be the next big problem for those people interested in controlling weapons of mass destruction because lasers are accessible by, by almost anybody. And then, of course, we have the problem of global warming. It's been addressed, I'm sure, in the past, but many cities will go underwater. I live in Manhattan, and there are maps of what Manhattan will look like by mid-century if global warming continues. So that's the bad news. However, the good news is that children are the vanguard of this revolution. They love the idea of being in a planetary civilization, and they are the ones who will make the final decision. They will live in a type one civilization. Okay, thank you very much, Michio. Uh, as you mentioned children, I uh, can't resist but quibbling with the rock and roll point. My children find my rock and roll music to be terribly old fashioned. So, um, uh, General Petraeus, please, and I personally would love to hear whether you agree with Michio's argument that democracies never fight democracies, among your other comments. Well, actually, uh, as a former soldier turned spy master who now has one foot in Wall Street and the other in academia, I'm going to take the conversation from the lofty to hard reality and use my five minutes to focus on four areas of particular concern I think that we should have as we examine the potential and the real shocks uh, that lie ahead. Uh, three of these are threats with which we need to continue to be concerned, uh, the existing threats of terrorism and proliferation of WMD, and then the emerging threat of offensive cyber actions and cyber crime. And then I'd like to briefly discuss the effects of the ongoing revolutions that are transforming the US and North America in particular, but are doing the same uh, increasingly throughout the rest of the world. First, the existing threats, terrorism. Uh, despite successes in degrading Al Qaeda's senior leadership in the tribal areas of Western Pakistan enormously. After all, removal of Osama bin Laden, three successive deputy leaders of Al-Qaeda and over a dozen of the other top 20 leaders, that effort still does have to continue. And there obviously needs to be continued and in some cases greater focus on Al-Qaeda affiliates in Yemen, Somalia, the Maghreb in North Africa, Syria and Iraq, and Nigeria not unilaterally, but in partnership with friends and allies to the greatest extent possible, noting that developments related to the Arab Spring have, in several of these cases, created opportunities for Al-Qaeda affiliates, and we must help counter these threats. The other existing threat with which we've long been concerned, the proliferation of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. This is, of course, why accounting for and destroying the chemical weapons in Syria is so important to us right now, why there is such concern about the Iranian nuclear program and where it might head, and the further development of nuclear weapons programs in North Korea, Pakistan, and other countries. Uh, these also uh, must be the focus of attention. The emerging threat associated with the offensive use of cyber capabilities is of increasing concern. Just in the last year or two, we've seen, for example, the damage done by offensive cyber employment against the, consumer, the uh, computer network of Saudi Aramco, the denial of service attacks on U.S. banks and other financial institutions, the New York Times and other systems, and the extraordinary theft of intellectual property, some $500 billion to $1 trillion worth by cyber operators traced by Mandiant Corporation in their open uh, discussion of this to a Chinese military element. 
These and many other actions in this area clearly highlight the concerns that stem from the increasing connectivity and dependence of all aspects of business, infrastructure, government, and personal activities to the internet and related information technology systems. And of course, the use of the internet by Al-Qaeda and other extremist elements has enabled recruiting of would-be extremists as well as the coordination of their activities, the sharing of bomb-making techniques and other aspects of extremist activity, and even fundraising. Finally, we need to think through the implications of what can truly be described as revolutions. Uh, again, beginning to reshape the U.S., North America, and having enormous impact throughout the world as well. I talked in the earlier panel about the ongoing energy revolution and how significant has been its impact on the U.S. with much, much more to come, and again, spreading to the, our NAFTA partners uh, of Mexico and Canada as well. Beyond that, there is the manufacturing revolution in which the U.S. also is among the leaders, robotics, three-dimensional printing, materials engineering. We heard some of this earlier about uh, what this is doing in various areas. This is enabled, made possible by the IT revolution, the movement to cloud computing with the enormous additional storage space that this provides and the computing power that it brings. And that further enables the life sciences revolution that's bringing personalized medicine and the developments made possible by advances in stem cell technology and genetics, among others. These revolutions are truly significant, and they will bring enormous benefits for mankind, but also pose considerable prospects for disruption to energy markets and a variety of aspects of the global economy, traditional manufacturing, uh, traditional health sciences, and the IT spaces. Now, having offered these observations, which could be seen in some respects as alarming, and I guess they are, I should note that despite the threats and challenges, I do want to state that I am a rational optimist, to use the term made popular by Matt Ridley. I think we'll find our way through all of it. Okay, I, I think we're going to have to ask you later on to elaborate on why you're a rational optimist, because rationally listening to your presentation, I've become quite pessimistic. So. Uh, we're going to need some grounds for that. Uh, and now, uh, please, our final speaker, Umberto. Thank you. And I will start by picking up the question uh, you, you uh, asked earlier about uh, democracy. Um, in the USC, certainly promoting democratic transition is a way to increase security and stability in the area. The problem, however, is how do you define democracy? What are the models? So the devil is in the details. It's not sufficient for a country to call itself the Democratic People's Republic or whatever to be a democracy. So you need, you need to have much more than that and, and, uh, and you need to be open and transparent. So uh, for us, managing democratic transition, uh, let's say in the post-Cold War era, uh, was the beginning of a view phase of a phase that was uh, felt as a, as a safer uh, uh, um, uh, f f a safer phase for everybody in the in the uh, Eurasian community or uh, transatlantic and Eurasian community that's covered by the OSC as a, as a large regional organization. Um, the agenda, however, has developed a lot over the last uh, 20 odd years uh, to a point uh, that we felt, now the Ukrainian chairmanship actually took the lead in, in, in moving us in this direction, we felt the need to sit down and redefine security today uh, from the perspective of, uh, of this regional community, wh where are the priorities, what are the challenges? And this turned into an extremely complicated discussion. We realized the agenda was so overloaded with all sorts of issues that it was hardly manageable. Uh, so we tried to systematize and we came up, I think, with three modes, if you want, of operation the organization in relation to various areas of, uh, of engagement. The first is the more traditional post-Cold War agenda. So the democratic transition we, 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 uh, we refer to, um, uh, uh, looking at uh, unresolved conflicts, operating mainly in the former Yugoslav, former Soviet spaces. Uh, but what we see is that there are some uh, still fundamental problems needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, lack of reconciliation, for instance. Uh, this is something that is very much uh, felt as uh, an, an obstacle to uh, uh, promoting a, a, a more stable uh, relationship within, within the community. We see fault lines moving, but remaining perhaps in a different mode, but, uh, but remaining. The discussion this morning and the Vilnius summit uh, are very much also about that. Uh, so th this is one uh, set of issues. Uh, that the, the approach is still a, a, 
uh, a zero sum approach in dealing, in dealing with this. The second is that the OSC as a community that was very self-contained in, in an east-west mode suddenly discovered that there is uh, a neighborhood and the developments in the neighborhood do affect the security of the regional community. So in fact the regional community, any regional community should start also looking uh, outside uh, its own uh, um, uh, boundaries in a way uh, to, to see. Uh, the, the example, the obvious example is Afghanistan and the impact that uh, developments in Afghanistan have on Central Asian countries and, and beyond. Uh, so we need to change mode of operation uh, where, wherever we act as we strengthen, let's say, rule of law in that area, uh, in that region. We need to reach out to Afghanistan. We need to prepare those countries to deal with challenges stemming from Afghanistan, but also to uh, uh, learn how to uh, themselves intervene and contribute in the long term to stabilize Afghanistan because it's in their long term interest. Um, the same applies to the Mediterranean, uh, the changes and the Arab Spring, if you want still to call it like that, uh, do affect in many ways uh, the security of Europe uh, and, and uh, the Middle East, of course, if you look also the relations, uh, the impact on Turkey, Caucasus, etc., and, uh, and, and, and even uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Northeast uh, Asia uh, angle uh, is, uh, is an issue that is appearing more prominently on, ag on the agenda of our organization. The third and final mode of operation is, uh, uh, is the, what we call the transnational challenges, the global challenges. Uh, from terrorism, uh, trafficking in all of its uh, expressions, from cigarettes to human, human beings. Trafficking in human beings is, a very, uh, is very high on the agenda of our organization. Uh, 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 weapons, non-proliferation, but, but then also other uh, uh, challenges and, and, and climate change is, uh, and all its ramifications, the uh, um, uh, food, uh, uh, food uh, energy, uh, uh, water nexus is something that we are looking into uh, ourselves because it has an impact on security in, in our space and beyond. Um, in that mode, uh, we can work in a different way. Uh, this is no more a, a zero-sum approach. Uh, it can be a win-win. You can improve uh, the ways you deal with these challenges across uh, the area where we operate, working on the weakest link of the chain and the stronger, uh, the more you strengthen the link, the stronger the, the whole chain is. Uh, so we need to identify the areas where we need to intervene, but we need also to change the, the, the approach because you need broader strategies. You can't, uh, this is an area where, and this applies also to the, the issues outside the region like Afghanistan, no single country, no single organization can make a difference. You need uh, to build uh, strategies uh, with international communities, with the key actors, and the big challenge is to have them all on the same page, of course. And, and that's where you see national agendas complicating the efforts of the international community to address these large problems. Thank you very much, Lamberto. General, were you wanting to jump in there? It looked like you were on the brink of it. Okay, I'm gonna get you to anyway. And the <laughs> point that I would like to sort of focus all of these comments on is really Larry's final point, because I, I think that's where we get to of living in a time of tremendous, exciting, very promising change, in terms of technology, in terms of emerging markets, even in terms of the spread of democracy, but at the same time, there being tremendous threats that are also thrown up by this. And I think, you know, Larry put it very well, or maybe Yates put it very well, um, that the key will be, can the democratic center, which also Lamberto has been talking about, the international democratic center, can it hold in the face of all of these challenges? And we're gonna ask you, General, uh, to address that maybe as the basis of your case for rational optimism. Really, the case for rational optimism rests on a bit more than that, frankly. And I think it's uh, partly the historical experience that we continually confront issues and we continually figure out how to work our way through them. I mean, if you look again at a very good U.S. example, 10 years ago, no one in his right mind, would have, even the folks in the energy technology space, never would have predicted that the United States would now be on the road to certainly energy independence and perhaps energy self-sufficiency if you wrap Canada and Mexico uh, into the picture. And you can come up with example after example of situations where we have felt that we've literally run out of airspeed and altitude uh, as a human race uh, and we've found out a way to keep the aircraft in flight. 
So I, I think, again, that's the basis. Uh, and as you take specific issues, uh, which is really what you have to do, and you obviously have to have a comprehensive approach uh, in all these areas. Sorry. Uh, as you develop a comprehensive approach uh, for all of the different issues that are out there, and that's what you have to do, whether it's in a comprehensive counterinsurgency campaign or uh, just a comprehensive uh, effort writ large by any single government or community of nations, uh, I think you can indeed work your way through the various issues. But there are going to be lots of bumps in the roads. Uh, it will be very, very hard at times. But as we used to say in Iraq during the surge, hard, hard is not hopeless. Larry? On balance, I share David's uh, rational optimism. If you look at the data, the human race makes immense progress. The number of people who die violent deaths as a fraction of the total population has trended downwards for a thousand years. It's famously said that markets climb walls of worry. And in many ways, conversations like this are self-denying prophecies. You express great concern about these threats, and that's what calls forth the actions that solve them. And that's my best guess. But there's no certainty. If you read the rhetoric of 1910, it is eerily familiar to the optimistic rhetoric of today. Greater economic integration, more progressive governments, Greater transportation and communication technologies mean all will be well, and all was spectacularly not well. And so there are no certainties. And I think it is, and here I'm going to disagree rather sharply with you, um, I'm afraid. I think it is important to avoid naivete and to recognize the world as it is. And the proposition that if we just promote democracy, all will be well, strikes me as wildly inaccurate as a reading of history and dangerous as a guide going forward. And I would just cite three things. First, to its moment, the US Civil War was a conflict of unprecedented viciousness and fatality, and it took place within a democracy. Second, Hitler was elected in an election, and look what followed that. And third, while there are many in this room who know far more about the Middle East than I, I think it is a fair judgment that the more direct and immediate translation of the passions of the people into the foreign policies of nations would not represent a step forward towards stability or peace. And so I think that to preserve order, that center that has to hold has to have a tough-minded realism in addition to a visionary idealism. Yeah, please, Michio, and then we'll start going to other people. Yeah, when you look at the, the march of history, it's going to be messy. But as Churchill said, okay, yeah, democracy has its problems, but it's still the best system there is. And if you don't believe me, name one that's better. Name one that's better. Now, democracy is not the answer. It's a byproduct. It's a byproduct of the fact that information is going to be free, freely available. It's going to be out there, and it's unstoppable. No one person can stop the Internet. If President Obama were to come out tomorrow and say, I'm going to outlaw the Internet, people would laugh. It's outside the capability of any government to withhold the Internet. And a byproduct of the internet is empowerment. Empowerment of people that have been disempowered 
because of the Cold War, dictatorships, feudal monarchies, and what have you. So it's not that democracy is the answer, because it's going to be messy. The, prob the, the answer is, I mean, the, what I'm trying to say is that democracy is a byproduct of this. That as we march toward a type one civilization, as we become more planetary, our consciousness changes, resources, science, that changes in a way that makes, enables more and more democracies. And as far as the Civil War is concerned, I don't think the South would consider themselves to be a true democracy. It was a slaveocracy, okay? So the point, in fact, there were two economic systems emerging, okay? The industrial North, based on blue collar work and the industrial proletariat, blah, blah, blah. And then the South, which was a slave economy, okay? I don't think it was democratic at all. I don't think any historian would say that the South was a democratic society, that slaves could vote or in any way participate in the destiny of the South. And black people, of course, made up a large population, sector of the population of the South. So I think the point here, though, is that you can see some signs of the future emerging. Now, we do know it's going to be messy. We've had three great revolutions of the past. The first was the agricultural revolution. Second was the industrial revolution. And now we're witnessing the third great revolution, the information revolution. And of course, it's going to be messy. And the center does not necessarily hold in some of these transitions. Look what happened to the French Revolution, for example. But I think what's happening here is the creation of enormous wealth, wealth on a scale that we've never seen before. And if there's rising inequality, it's simply still minor compared to the way it's been in the past. Now, if you take a look at the so-called hollowing out of the middle, you realize, as I said, that it's not the rich people robbing the poor. It's the rich people taking advantage of high technology, taking advantage of these things. Every time you sell a product, you can now sell more products, get a larger fraction, more efficient fraction of every product you sell, and therefore make more money. So the solution to that is education. We have to educate people. Right now, we educate people to live in the world of 1950. Take a look at all our college curriculum. Okay. I'll, I'll let you finish your sentence, Michio, but we should move on. Okay, just real quick. We have to educate people. We graduate people into the unemployment line, basically. The job market is changing. Entry-level jobs simply will not exist in the future. Okay, Ron, please. I'd like to bring us back to the real world. Um, I have traveled in the last 13 years to 171 countries, 171. Met people at all levels. And there are only a handful of countries that I've been to where I can speak without someone having a headset, or without an interpreter being there. And I don't see people screaming and crying to want to learn English if they work in travel or hotels or restaurants yet. But most people, they want to get a good job, they want their families to be safe and educated, and they want hope. Right? That's what most people I've met care about. Second point, the safety issue. What's one certainty is that no matter what country you're in the world, no matter who you're speaking to, if they don't feel safe, then governments will change, democratic or non-democratic. And I'll close with this example. I was speaking to the wife of the governor of Rio de Janeiro. This is maybe five years ago. The wife of the governor. And she said the most important thing for her every day is when she gets home without having been attacked or raped. When she closes the door and she's in her home safely. And I'm saying for us as a world, we can have these macro discussions. But the bottom line is, as my son says, Papa, what have you done today to make the world safer? And I think fighting terrorism at the micro level, macro level, fighting transnational organized crime, fighting the people, the predators who are gonna be working on the internet to lure our children I think those are the areas, if we focus on those areas, we can make the world safer, irrespective of what kind of government we are in, irrespective of what languages we speak, or what country we belong to. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we now have a few minutes where we can take some comments and questions from the floor, and I'd like to start with Judy Miller. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, and I see you're it's all gentlemen. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here for the first time at this panel, and I, because I'm a journalist, I think you'd have to put me down into the rational skeptic category. 
And I guess I want to throw out some questions for this panel that each of you may feel comfortable, more comfortable answering than others. The first is looking at the past, does that not necessarily mis, uh, risk misleading uh, us about the future? For example, yes, American and world technology has been able to solve many problems, but I think there is an agreement in most educated, civilized parts of the world that you can't refreeze the polar ice cap and that what's happening to the planet cannot be undone. As more and more people, we just heard from the last panel that we're going to, we're adding now cities of a million, greater than a million people once a week. I mean, do we not reach some kind of finite point where the center simply cannot hold because the conditions of the planet on which we're living change? So number one. Number two, we've heard very little at this session, at this conference, about the role of the United States of America. I find that interesting since in America we tend to talk about very little else. But uh, given the relative decline of the world's great democracy economically and the rise of a country which cannot be called democratic, at least not yet, China, how does that affect your calculations about the tri inevitable triumph of democracy or the fact that there may be other systems that could be better served in a planet that is severely strained resources where there's growing com competition for resources. And finally, three, a down-to-earth journalist question. People in my profession who study the Middle East and national security have had three great shocks in the past month. One was the United States announcing that we were going to bomb Syria. Two, the announcement a week later that we were not going to bomb Syria. Three, the Syrian and Russian announcement, or perhaps I should reverse that, that, that Syria was going to give up its chemical weapons. What's the next great shock in the development of this story, General Petraeus? Do you believe that the Syrians are serious? Do you believe that the world will rid itself of another category of weapons of mass destruction in the most unstable region of the Middle East? And what role, since we're sitting here in the Ukraine, which well understands what Russian pressure is all about. Are the Russians likely to play, and do you see the Russians playing in the evolution of this continuing melodrama at which a great deal is at stake? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Judy. A very great deal of excellent questions there. Our time is running out, and then we're gonna be followed by a truly star-studded panel. So I'm gonna take a few more questions now before getting the answers so more people can speak. So please. Yeah. We haven't heard Poland for a while. Yes, so. I'm from Poland. Marek Siewiec from European Parliament. Actually, I feel a little bit upset after such a wide range of uh, questions, but the, the title of this discussion was very encouraging, uh, asking for good news and bad news. Um, and uh, this, this, this conference, uh, th th this despite this divided in the session, but this is as a whole. I want to refer to this, what Mr. Summers said a few hours before, that first time uh, uh, in the history, the American generation, uh, young generation is worse educated and uh, uh, have, a, have no promise to have a better life uh, than uh, their, their parents. So I want to uh, ask you about two bad news which are uh, imp impressing me. Uh, having uh, the general uh, CIA uh, police officer and uh, ad, uh, economic uh, and, the, and the physics uh, theoretical, I, I feel comfortable presenting uh, my doubts. My first doubt is, I don't afraid, I'm not afraid of Al-Qaeda. Of course, I'm afraid as a, as a person, but I'm afraid of, uh, of, of revolution. First time in the history of the world, in Europe, we have one force of young education of people who are not un unemployed. We have people wh whom we don't need at all. We cannot offer them anything. We cannot offer job, future, hope, whatever, whatever. And this is not a case of, of Spain protesting uh, in, the, in the squares of Spain. This is the case of every European country. We don't need one force of population of young people with all the consequences. 
they have no job, they can leave, they have something to eat, they have internet. And these people having internet, they can recognize how long is the biggest yacht of the Russian oligarchs and how many yachts have uh, this one oligarchs. And never in the history of the world, please correct me, I am not the historian, there was no such a material diversity uh, uh, between these who have a lot and these who have a little. And this is not a problem. The problem is this who have a little, they know about this, what these rich guys have. So I think we are in the front of the revolution, very close to the revolution. What kind of revolution? I don't know. But tell me whether I'm right or not wrong. Are we in the eve of the revolution? Thank you. Okay, another excellent question. I'll take a couple more, and then we'll let the panel respond en masse. Tak, proszę. The Ukrainians have also to be engaged into this very interesting discussion. My name is Vasily Filipchuk, and Ron asked it actually a very good question: uh, What uh, losses from uh, secret smuggling mean for Ukrainian budget? I calculated it's exactly the annual budget of Foreign Ministry of Ukraine with all its embassies, or it's around uh, 80,000 annual jobs of teachers in Ukraine. So it's really significant. But the good news is that recently a number of people present in this room uh, uh, can tell about it, we established together with the European Union a very, a very good institution on Ukraine-Moldova border. Uh, its name is EU MAM, uh, and it's a border mission on a conflict area of uh, Transnistria, which helps significantly to decrease number of smuggled cigarettes. So my conclusion is that the problem is not cigarettes, innovation, computers, internet, but institutions. Right institutions in right place, with right mandate, with right people. So don't you think that real discussion should be not about all these important things, but about institutions which either incentivize people to innovate, to work, to fight, or uh, vice versa. Uh, if someone knows that tax officer will come and tax to the death any business, there is no any incentive to uh, develop business. That institutions make uh, all these beautiful things which you described uh, happen, or vice versa. Thank you. Okay, and I'll take one final question, please. Debate Toms, I'm a lawyer in Ukraine for the past 23 years and chairman of the British Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce. The chief scientist of the UK has predicted that by the end of this decade, the world begins to run out of food. It takes some time to increase uh, food production in a meaningful way. Is this a shock that we need to focus on now? Okay, thank you very much. So we've had a very uh, wide menu of questions to answer. Are we gonna have a revolution? Should we focus on institutions? What about global warming, food shortage, US versus China? And particularly for you, General Petraeus, uh, to forecast what's gonna happen with Syria. Uh, so all easy. Uh, and I think we'll, I'll take the panel just in the order that we have. Or, okay, actually, General Petraeus, why don't you do Syria, and then we'll give everyone a last word. You can answer which question you prefer. Well, I need to warm up before I get to Syria, because I, look, I mean, it's a statement of the obvious that, Judy, that lessons of the past can obfuscate and confuse as much as they can illuminate. It's how you use them, and uh, we all have to try to study it very, very carefully and then understand the context of the present as we look to see what the past can tell us uh, about the way forward. Um, gosh, I did talk about the role of the US with the natural gas revolution, all the other revolutions, and in fact made the bold prediction that we are on the threshold of not just the US decades, but the North American decades. So yes, we sh clearly, uh, population, demography, e economic trends, all host of factors do indeed compel us to do a bit of the Asian pivot, uh, but at the end of the day, we shouldn't forget what's happening uh, closer to home if you're from America, uh, and that is in, indeed, again, what is going on uh, in what I do believe will be the North American decades. I didn't say century, by the way, just said decades. Um, the next developments in Syria, well, we're gonna get a pretty good indicator tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is when uh, we're supposed to see the uh, the layout, the identification of all of the chemical weapons and precursors and so forth that the regime has, the indicators are right now that we will not see that. So that's a little bit of a hint, I think, uh, that this may not be the smoothest of roads going forward, uh, but clearly a very, very important development uh, and 
you know, you asked, will Russia play a key part? Of course, it has played a key part in this and it will continue to play a key role uh, in the evolution of the uh, identification, the inspection, and then the ultimate destruction uh, of these weapons, uh, if the, that is what is going to happen. Um, with respect, I do think you should be afraid of Al-Qaeda. Um, I was in that business and uh, I think it's healthiest when you are wary about what extremists, transnational extremists, can do uh, to your country and your countrymen. But we obviously should also be concerned about the high levels of unemployment, the economic displacement, and the potential for social disruption, which I think, with respect, is probably more realistic uh, than outright revolution. Uh, and I think those are very real concerns for countries that are uh, having to deleverage after living beyond their means for a number of decades at the least. Okay, and you know what? I'm just going to now ask Larry quickly to respond to the revolution and institutions part of that menu of questions because I think that spoke most uh, to your comments about the center holding. What do you think? I'll say the one thing that everyone will agree with. I don't know. Having, having, having said that, I guess I would say two things. One, when I hear these litanies about American decline, I'm reminded uh, that I went to special science programs when I was that I went to special science programs when I was in elementary school because we thought we were going to fall behind the Soviet Union after Sputnik and John Kennedy died believing Russia would outstrip the United States by 1980. I remember as a college student Henry Kissinger pursuing a strategy of detente because the constellation of forces was moving against the United States after Vietnam. I remember the ubiquitous joke in 1991 that the Cold War was over and Germany and Japan had won. So I think of these periods of anxiety about the United States as part of a process of renewal that we have always gone through. Patrick Henry said sometime in the 1790s, that the spirit of the revolution had already been lost. And so I am ultimately optimistic. I'm ultimately optimistic because I believe that ultimately the center will hold. But I observe that today we could be debating what to do about global climate change. We could be debating in a fundamental way our strategic alignment towards the Middle East. We could be debating how our social institutions need to adapt to information technology and rising unemployment. And what is our Congress in fact debating? It is debating whether we are going to pay our national debt or not. Now, in the Summers family, I have kids who went to college, and sometimes we do have fights about spending. They spend more money than I thought they should. And then there's a debate. Do they have to pay, or is dad going to bail them out? The alternative that because we can't agree, we will stiff Visa is not an alternative in the Summers family's debate. And it should, not be a de it should not be an alternative in the debate of the United States of America. And so ultimately, I'm even more convinced than uh, David that the power of human ingenuity exceeds the risk of problems thrown up by new technology. You know, Jevons famously wrote in the 1890s about how London was going to be buried by 1930 under three feet of horse manure uh, on every street, not foreseeing the automobile. 
So I'm, yes, global warming is a huge problem, but it is a solvable, uh, it is a solvable uh, problem. But the hard question is, will each generation succeed in finding the political way that will enable us to realize all that potential and to avoid the risks. And no one can study the history of the 20th century without knowing that sometimes generations don't rise to that challenge. And that's why I come back to the question of whether the center will hold. Okay. We now have, we're about to have uh, President Clinton and Prime Minister Blair address us. That's why you see lots of security movement over there. So we need to wrap up super quickly. I want to give every panelist a last word and really one word since we're going to have these great leaders talking to us. If you were in charge, what's the one issue you'd be focusing on? And go in order from here. So Lamberto, what's the one we should focus on the most? I would focus on youth and uh, youth. Working, working with young people, I think looking at the future, strategic approaches to deal with the big issues of tomorrow. General? Policies, laws, regulations, practices that enable us to capitalize best on the revolutions that I've described here. I would say a scientific education, uh, the so-called hollowing out of the middle is not necessarily a question okay, of robbery. Yeah. It's a question of the fact that the middle is not educated enough to get the jobs of the future. Jobs and growth so there will be the confidence that problems can be solved. <laughs> this, this is going to be very positive, very positive. Just focus on doing anything in your power to keeping yourself and your loved ones safe. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for an excellent discussion.